to you, old Ireland, since I must go away. I now shake hands and bid goodbye, and can no longer stay. Our big ship lies in deep lock foil, bound for the New York shore. And I must go from all I know and love them more and more. That little town encircled round with many is the grove and hill where lads and lasses they do meet for pleasure there's the room through spring hill braes and flowery fields where oft I've wandered all and by side was the girl I loved, the rose of money more. The pigeons coo and sad the blackbirds lay, and loud and high the thrushes cry on a long bright summer's day. And as I sat down to cry, me fill, sure the tears come trickling down. For in My own dear native town Kind friends, I'll bid you all that you I can no longer stay Our big ship sails tomorrow And it's time I was away So fill your glasses to the brim and toast with one loud roar And we'll sing in praise of Spring Hill praise And lovely money more country boy when I left that dusty town. Route 66 to the westward and I hopped an old freight down. California, here I come, by the side door Pullman and sunburn thumb. They called us Okies low-down bums, the police on a sprout. Never tire of the road, never tire of the rolling wheel, never tire of the ways of the world. Way out yonder's a calling and the dark road leads me onwards On the highway, that's my car With the lonesome voice I heard in my headset Never tire of the road California to the New York Island Me and my guitar And we 
played in many a hobo jungle, many a skid row bar. Standing out in the wind and the rain, that lonesome whistle is a sweet refrain when you're waiting for some old freight train that carries an empty car. Never tire of the ride, never tire of the rolling wheel, never tire of the ways of the world. Way out yonder's a call. And the dark road leads me onwards On the highway, that's my car With the lonesome voice I heard in my headset Never tell you of the ride Shipped on board of a liberty ship To sail the ocean blue We were carrying guns, TNT soldiers too. All of the men on board agreed with Cisco, Jimmy Longy and me, and our song rang out across the sea. You fascists bound to lose. Oh yes, all of you fascists bound to lose. All of you fascists bound to lose. Bound to lose, you fascists bound to lose. Don't let the Mara fool you or take you by surprise. The dirty smell of the politician and the man with the greed in his eyes. One big union, that's our plan. Use your only man The flames of discontent We'll fan for the cause That never dies Never tire of the ride Never tire of the rolling wheel Never tire of the ways of the world Way out yonder's a calling me And the dark road leads me onwards On the highway that's my call The lonesome voice I heard in my headset Never tire of the ride We might uh, go back a few years. You uh, were born into a fairly musical family, weren't you? Well, uh, th that's a moot point, really, because my mother had been a, a musical comedy actress, uh, but she'd given up the stage when I was born, so I never got to see her perform on the stage. But she always, she always missed it. Uh, and on Saturday mornings and Sunday mornings, uh, she and my father would invite their friends in for gin and tonics, etc. And my mother would gradually, as, as the, the alcohol began to, to flow through her veins, she would become the, the, the total center of attraction. And I remember slightly tipsy, middle-aged women leaving our flat and saying, oh, Andrew, your mother is so brilliant. <laughs> and uh, she, she, um, she'd been in a show called Sunny, which was a... I think it was written by um, Jerome Kern. I mean, it was a kind of top of the mm. top draw stuff, and uh, she played the lead. You know, not not in the West End of London, but in, around uh, around all the, the the provinces and in Dublin and Belfast. And um, there was a hit number from that called "Who." And when I was when I was young, it used to come on the radio all the time, and. Uh, when it, when, when it came on, it was usually instrumental, and my mother would come out and perform it in the, in the, the living room as if she was on the, the stage. You know? And of course, a 10-year-old boy uh, is always, I think, embarrassed by everything his mother does. <laughs> so <coughs> I'd be sitting there going, kind of, oh, 
mum, stop. And she'd be going kind of, who stole my heart away? Who makes me dream all day? Dreams I know will never come true. Seems as though I'll ever be blue. Who means my happiness? Who should I answer yes to? Well, can't you guess you? No one but you. <laughs> <laughs> Now, your dad, too, um, he apparently played saxophone, but you, well, you never heard him play. No, I never heard him play. He'd played at school. I think he played in the school band. And I never saw a saxophone in the house. Uh, but he was very into early jazz, you know, kind of... Um, uh, what, what was your man's name? Uh, Oliver. Um, Oh, the early New Orleans jazz. And, ah, uh, yeah. yeah, Bix Beidebeck. That, yeah. He was really into Bix Beidebeck. Beidebeck. Yeah. And, and a very good music it was, too. But um, he took a back seat totally after he married my mother. She, was, she had personality yeah. enough for the two of them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Reading a, a little bit about you, I, I found it extraordinary that you were sent off to boarding school when you were only three and a half years mm. old. That but, seems extraordinary. Well, it does to me, too, and it's never been explained. Uh, I mean, I, I should have asked my parents when they were alive what they were up to. Mm. But uh, I, was, I was a terrible mummy's boy, you know. I mean, uh, I do remember my sister telling me that when my mother went out shopping, if she wasn't going to bring me, I had to be brought to the window and something would be pointed out. Oh, look at that bird on the tree there. You know, it's, oh, what a pretty bird. You know. Meanwhile, my mother would slip out, and moments later, I would realise the trick, and I would turn and scream, <laughs> "Mummy!" <laughs> so uh, it may have been that that became unbearable. Uh, and, uh, did, and they, did that experience shape your life, the boarding school? Uh, yes, it did uh, very much so, and. Um, you know, I can remember very little about three-and-a-half-year-old boarding school. So it, it put me into a trauma, I think, until mm. I was about nine or ten. Um, but it, what it did do was it made me completely self-sufficient or f made me feel that I was self-sufficient. You know, if, if, I had, uh, if I had thoughts or whatever, they were, they were mine. And the only place I really felt uh, safe was when I was in bed at night. When did music personally come into your life that you were playing? Well, my mother had all these cracked old 78s and a wind-up gramophone. And I used to play these, these dreadful old pieces from long-forgotten shows. Uh, and I, I quite enjoyed that experience, but, um, but I, I knew that it wasn't the music that I, that I was really looking for. And... I waited, and, and you know, when I was about 14, there was suddenly a big, uh, it wasn't called Rhythm and Blues at the time, but it was kind of Fats Domino, um, Jerry Lee Lewis, I suppose. Mm -hmm. so, with the, with the, the introduction of the 45 single, uh, there were all these really good um, Rhythm and Blues musicians who started recording. And a lot of my friends got into that. And I, I you know, I thought it was good enough, but uh, it wasn't until I heard... Uh, the bold Lonnie Donegan and the Skiffle, and the Skiffle yeah. uh, era that I thought, yes, that's the music I've been waiting to hear. And of course, the big hit for Lonnie Donegan in Australia at the time that I remember from my youth was My Old Man's a Dustman. Oh, yeah. Well, that was a little bit later. Yeah. You know, uh, Lonnie Donegan was only actually of interest for a very short time because once he, once he became <laughs> popular, he started uh, singing kind of popu populist mm. songs. But... But the first two EPs he made, I mean, I, I, I can remember standing on a deserted London railway station singing, it takes a worried, it takes a worried man to sing a worried song. It takes a worried man to sing a worried song. It takes a worried man to sing a worried song. I'm worried now, but I won't be worried long. And, <clears throat> you know, this slightly short of lyrics, I suppose, really, but... Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I, I sang this on the, and I thought, that's, that's wonderful, I love that. Yeah. So uh, that was really where I came in. Acting? You were a young oh. actor. A, yes, almost I was. Almost a yeah. child prodigy, I oh, believe. Well, I was a child actor, you know, I mean, uh, child, for, for most children, if the, acting is, is second nature. And I was, I was a really good child actor. 
Um, I made a film with uh, um, a Canadian actor called Bonner Colino, uh, and Gina Lola Brigida was in it, but I never met her because she was, she was filmed in, in uh, Italy. And uh, I just got hold of a copy of that uh, about six months ago. And it's amazing to see, to see yourself age nine acting. And I was really good. <laughs> yeah, I was excellent. But uh, unfortunately, when I got to about the age of 15, uh, something happened to my hormones and I became <laughs> totally uh, self-conscious. And, and I was never a good actor after that. There was a story of you too with uh, Pre De Sellers. And in fact, Pre De Sellers gave you a guitar. Yes, he did, yeah. How did that come about? Well, Peter Sellers was a very odd man, uh, and I was in this, this play with him in, in the West End in London called Brouhaha, and he, I think he'd been to a Spanish restaurant the night before, mm. and probably had a bit too much to drink, and, and a, a guy, the, the, you know, the, the, uh, the troubadour came out and played the Spanish guitar, and I don't know, what, maybe Peter Sellers kind of, maybe, maybe Peter Sellers is saying, Jesus, how, how can I stop this guy? And he thought, ah, I know, I'll buy his guitar. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, he bought the guitar off the bloke, and uh, the next day he, I got a message, Peter would like to see you in his dressing room. And I went down, and he said, um, he said oh, well, what do you think of this? And I played it, and it wasn't all that good. But uh, at the time, I was playing classical music. So I played some piece, and uh, he said, oh, that's very nice, that's very nice, Andrew. He said, um, that guitar is yours with my compliments. To Woody Guthrie, where did uh, Woody Guthrie, how did that influence come about? Well, that was again from Lonnie Donegan. Um, I read on the back of one of, one of Lonnie Donegan's albums uh, that he was singing a song that had been written by this man called Woody Guthrie, and I thought it was a brilliant name. I, I was very in, uh, inclined to like names and words and numbers were very important to me at that age. And uh, I thought, well, I'd, I'd love to hear this guy. I wonder how it's possible. And I was walking down the street one day and I passed a small record shop and there in the front was a yellow 12-inch LP called More Songs by Woody Guthrie and Cisco Houston. And I went in and bought it. <clears throat> and when I was leaving, I thought, hey, this is a strange title, More Songs. I said, how many more of these albums do you have? And they said, oh, well, that's the only one. And, you know, at the time, I didn't, I didn't know anything. And I thought, well, if that's their first album, it's a very odd name to call it, More Songs by <laughs> Woody Guthrie and Cisco Houston. But, of course, it wasn't. And, and uh, um, I put it on the... the uh, on the, the, the Dansett record player. Did you have a Dansett record player? No, I had a little AWA. Oh, but same, same difference, I'm sure. You pressed a little thing and the, uh, the arm raised with intent and moved Ooh, over to the, yeah, and, and dropped down. It was all done automatically. And, and then there was a kind of as it kind of found the, the starting groove. And the very first sound that, that came out, I thought, yes, that's it. Mm. The, the social conscience, the social justice, the feeling for uh, the repressed, where did that come from? Was that the Woody Guthrie influence or was there somebody in your life that um, was a mentor when you were young? No, it all came. I, I bought Woody Guthrie lock, stock and barrel. Mm. And uh, I bought... <coughs> I, I think I had a kind of... I had a general feeling... Um, for equality anyway, because my parents were, they were middle class and they were slightly, well, snobbish to be frank, you know. Um, you know, one of the things I used to enjoy doing, we lived in a big block of flats and one of the porters, as they were called then, was a, a really nice guy who used to empty the, empty the, the bins, empty the dustbins. And when I was about seven or eight, I used to enjoy going with him, emptying the dustbins, and, and looking through for, for kind of interesting things in the dustbins. <clears throat> and my parents didn't, didn't think this was something I should be doing with, with the, uh, the porter, <laughs> you know? And I, and I think that kind of, I thought, well, why not? And I never, so I, I, I quickly had a, um, a, a bit of a, a ding-dong with my father about that. 
because he, you know, he felt that uh, one shouldn't um, be having uh, much to do with with the people who were kind of in 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 service like that. And I didn't understand that at all because this guy was really nice, and I didn't I didn't see why there was any difference. And uh, <laughs> so when 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 I uh, when I bought Woody Guthrie and realized that uh, that was a, a, a facet of his belief, then uh, you know, I, I just uh, took that on board. How did it develop from there to, to playing and playing gigs? Well, I studied, I studied Woody Guthrie, you know. I, mm. I, uh, <laughs> I was pretty good at playing his guitar lick, uh, and I desperately tried to copy his Oklahoma accent. And... Uh, <laughs> And then I, I, he also played the mandolin, and I, I, uh, I started trying to play the mandolin. I, I, uh, he also played the fiddle a bit, which I never quite managed. But I did buy, I, bu I, I bought a harmonica, and the next day I met and became friends with rambling Jack Elliott. And Jack told me that Woody used to play the, the harmonica upside down, with the, the low notes on the right-hand side. Uh, and... Fortunately, I, I learned this before I, I learned the harmonica, so I play the harmonica like Woody, upside down. <laughs> Tell us, um, because I don't think many Australians actually know this piece of history, the song The Gladiators and the industrial ah, yeah. workers of the world yeah, yeah, and, the, yeah. and the Wobblies yeah. and Tom Barker. How, how did you come across that story? Well, I was interested in the IWW from quite an early uh, stage of my, my, my interest in social history. And um, I think the very first time, or one of the first times I came to Australia, I bought a book called The IWW in the First World War. And, uh, and that's, how, that's how I began to, that's how I learned the story. And I remembered then that when I was in the BBC, I'd actually met Tom Barker in the bar without knowing who he was and without being particularly interested. But... Uh, the, it, it, you know, it, it, it's a footnote, really, in history, and I, we'll sing it later, so I, I don't want to, to, mm. to, to tell the introduction, but um, uh, you, back yeah. in the early part of the 20th century, a lot of people had some very good ideas, which, uh, unfortunately, don't seem to have any more. <laughs> I don't know about that. Look, uh, for, just a line from that song, and we, we will hear this later, but... Uh, you, you saved Tom Barker from an early age. He knew he was born to fan the flames. Yeah. When did you know that you were born to fan the flames? Well, I'm not sure I was born to fan the flames, but I, I learned uh, to fan the flames of discontent was, was one of the, 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 uh, the phrases that the IWW, the Industrial Workers of the World, used. Um, try, you know, to try and make people who, were, who had lousy jobs or who were paid poor money or treated badly, try and make them realize that they, they were discontented. Um, and uh, it just, it, it all led on from after Woody Guthrie and after Tom Barker and a whole heap of other people, I, I realized that, uh, that that was the side I was on and uh, that I do my best at least through song to, to fan the flames of discontent. Mm -hmm. I mentioned uh, when we started uh, itchy feet, that you, you've had itchy feet, you've travelled widely around the world. When did you and how did you gain that interest in world music or what is known as world music these days and all the different instruments that you play? I suppose, again, it was probably Woody Guthrie. Like Woody was, uh, Woody was an inveterate traveller by by, uh, as they used to say, by side door pullman and the sunburnt thumb, meaning the freight train and the, and the hitchhiking. And uh, back in 1968, I, I decided, I suddenly got bitten by this desire to travel in Europe. <coughs> and um, I set out in 1968. I, I, I went to, I didn't go that far. A lot of people um, at that time were traveling. And a lot of people, most people were going to India and Afghanistan, and, and 
I think the Beatles had been there and the Maharishi was there and drugs were there. And none of these things really uh, um, excited me particularly. So I decided to go to, to the Balkans where um, I had been a, a, an avid collector of stamps and had always been fascinated by the Cyrillic alphabet. And uh, there was no, really no other reason to go there than, than just somewhere to go. And it was, a, it was an area that... Um, not many people went to at the time. And it was, I learned, the first time I heard Bulgarian music, I was blown away. How did they take to what you were doing at the time, what you were playing, and, and Woody Guthrie in your own, own material? Yeah, um, well, I can remember playing for, at, at, a, at one of the Bulgarian national days, uh, they asked me to play, and I closed my eyes and I sang my song, and when I opened my eyes, they were all gone. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about the bazooki, the Greek bazooki, and uh, how that was drawn into uh, Irish music and uh, what you were doing. Well, we all, back in 1963, a lot of my circle of people played mandolins because that was the only instrument uh, of that type that could be found. And they were largely Italian mandolins with a bowl-shaped back. Uh, and we, kind of, we always wished that we could, we could get that sound, but a little bit deeper, a little bit lower in pitch. And Johnny Moynihan turned up one day in 1965 with a Greek bazooki, and we thought it was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> we told him to stick it up mm, you know, <laughs> take out the mandolin again <clears throat> but he didn't, he persisted and he got a flat back mandolin uh, uh, bazooki made and uh, from there it, it, it uh, took off you know. and I think one of the exponents that, that, who's probably made it most popular is Donald Lunny mm. who developed a style of accompanying uh, jigs and reels on the bazooki that was uh, uh, absolutely brilliant and, and uh, so it became the, the norm for an Irish band to have a bazooki player rather than a necessarily a guitar player and the mention of um, Don I, I suppose brings us to Plansky just to tell we haven't got a huge amount of time but just tell us a, a little bit about that period okay. of your life and there were two periods really with Plansky <coughs> well Plansky um was the the the, um, the idea of Christy Moore? <clears throat> Christy Christy had been uh, Christy had worked from the bank in Ireland, and there was a big bank strike in 1967, I think, and everybody who worked for the bank got laid off, and Christy went to England and became very big on the uh, English folk scene, singing and playing the guitar. And he made a, a record um, in 1971 called Prosperous. And he asked Don Lunny, who he knew uh, most of his life, and me and Liam O'Flynn to play on it and mm. some others. And it was, it, it was good crack and it was a great success. And um, one day he said, how would, you f how would you feel about forming a band? And I remember I wasn't entirely... Uh, taken with this because I was playing with Donald at the time and really enjoying playing as a duo and I said well what does Donald think and he said oh he's way into it and I thought mm, traitor <laughs> and uh, and then I said and then I produced what I thought would be the trump car and I said ah but what about Liam because Liam Liam was was a very kind of uh, uh, traditional musician and uh, the thought of him being seen with guitars and mandolins and bazookis was kind of a bit dodgy. And Chrissy said, he's into it. And I thought, oh, okay. Well, I'd better be into it too. So I said, yeah, yeah, way heavy into it, yeah, yeah. So Planksy was formed in 1972. It was an overnight success. I mean, the first gig we played was supporting Donovan in Galway, and we blew him off the stage, literally. I mean, we... It was a wonder he ever managed to get on the stage after us because we, <laughs> we, were, we went down fantastically well. And, and for a, uh, a year or two, we were right up there, and it was a big success. And, and then Donal left, um, and the thing began, to, began gradually to become a bit of a, a, a drag, you know, and, and 
we were all tired of, of this sitting in the back of a transit van going from Germany to Switzerland to France to Ireland. And so we split up in 1975. Uh, <clears throat> and we were, we were split up then for about four years and got back in 79. And then we split up again in 1983. And then we got back again in 2004, which was a wonderful, wonderful experience. And how did you find the difference in 2004 from those early years to the musical maturity of the people that you, you're playing well, with? Well, it's very interesting, Tim, because we played the same material. In 2004, about 80% of it was the old material. Uh, and we played it better than we had done 20 years before. Mm. And I, I, I still couldn't explain that, except it must have been age and experience. <laughs> they count for something. There's a lesson in all this for, for, for musicians too, because you, you didn't become financially wealthy in the early years no, with Plansky, did you? No, never did, no. no. <laughs> but I don't know have. how that happened. Uh, we were too busy enjoying the music and the fame and we overlooked the finance, I'm afraid. But uh, Well, we were ripped off, you know, I mean, in the usual fashion. We signed a, a record contract which uh, looked good on paper and ultimately produced no money at all. Hmm. Let's just talk a little bit about your music and the instruments and the way you choose songs and the instruments to play with those songs. And we, we've got here... What looks like a bazooki to me, but well, it is like, actually. It's, a, it's is like it? a big mandolin. This it's mm. a mandola. And it's it, it's nice because <clears throat> like all these instruments are, are a lot less complicated than a guitar. I mean, uh, in the old days we didn't know anything about uh, Dad Gad, which is a guitar tuning um, a lot more modal and a lot more like this than the classical guitar tuning. Um, so you could play things that, where you, you know, the, the third of a, uh, of a chord. That note there. Is, is not a particularly Irish note, the third. And on a classical guitar, you had about three of them. Uh, so it, it, it didn't work as well as uh, as well as I mean you could play you know you on this you can play a, a, a D chord with with no third in it at all or it's all right the third is okay but as long as it's not there's only one of them <laughs> yeah. It's 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 uh, it has great limitations, and the limitations of the instrument are to its advantage, really, in in, in folk and traditional music. Uh, if, I mean, I, I sometime uh, in the 1980s, I began to get kind of uh, complicated, and I started playing uh, a lot of chords, like major sevenths, like. which are not intrinsically very uh, uh, folk chords. But if you've only got four strings, you can't play a full rippling lounge chord, lounge lizard chord of, of G major seven. So, you know, so in its place, that, that, that's quite a nice chord. Or... But, uh, so, so, so that's basically it, you know, that the, the instrument is limited uh, and its limitations are to its advantage in traditional music. Mm. We might just uh, finish up this little chat and the, I'd like you to uh, tell a story. I hope you weren't going to tell this later on in the, in the, in the concert. But uh, I made, made a note here about this. 1980 in the Balkans and you're on a bit of a sentimental journey and there was a war exercise on. Oh, yes. And you got arrested. Yes, I did, yeah. Do you want to tell that story? <laughs> well, 
You know, when I've been hitchhiking, I always, on the, on the Black Sea coast, you couldn't really expect to hitchhike uh, down to the very south of Bulgaria where it joins Turkey. And in the 1980s, I actually went with a car. I had a car by that time. And I drove down this road, and uh, lorry drivers coming the other way were going kind of... And I thought, what's, that? what's all that about? And eventually I got to where I wanted to go to, which is a town called Achtopol. And uh, I got out of the car and I walked to a headland and I looked out over the Black Sea and I saw this, uh, sol this, this kind of colonel, you know, kind of uh, with binoculars uh, and a whole troop of soldiers there. And, uh, and I looked at them and, and they looked at me. They were about kind of two kilometers away. And I saw the guy go, And I, and, and I didn't look anymore. I thought, uh-oh, I see what's <laughs> happening here. I'm not supposed to be here. So I got back in the car, and I drove north. And I'd gone about, I, I went a long way. I went about 60 kilometers north. And I went into this, I was driving through this village square. And I was stopped by a soldier. And he held me at gunpoint there um, for about an hour while the, the commanding officer uh, came up. And... You know, I, I wasn't able to, if I wanted to get something from the, from the car, I was kind of, no, 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 keep your hands, you know. So it was kind of, it, it wasn't scary, because it's amazing how, uh, if you're innocent, you believe no harm can come to you. <laughs> and, uh, and all the village women were coming up to him, and, and I could tell from, uh, they were saying, they were saying to him, ah, for, oh, for God's sake, he's only a tourist, leave him alone. Like, you know, they're all on my side. And uh, so anyway, he, he was completely uh, impassive. And eventually the, the commanding officer and three other commanding officers came up and demanded my passport. And uh, they wanted to take a photograph of it, but the camera didn't work. And... Uh, Eventually, they eventually they they, they let, had to let me go, and I never I never really did understand whether whether I was just being used as part of the war exercise. It was you know it might be aha a spy, <laughs> you know maybe maybe that was it. It was kind of let's pretend this this man is a spy. Um, but I do remember as I drove off, I had I'd arrived without any uh, attempt to. I'd arrived at a relationship with this soldier who'd held me at gun at gunpoint, you know. And as I drove out past him, I kind of I, I waved at him, and he waved back at me, you know. And it was, you know, that thing. Did they call it the Stockholm uh, something? It's it's when if you're being held hostage for for years, like people have been, yeah. you you actually form Super. a relationship with your yeah. with your captors. Uh, and it was perhaps it was the same kind of effect as that, but uh, we were good friends without knowing it. <laughs> as well, he shot me dead. <laughs> <laughs> well, Andy Irvine, uh, may the uh, fans that flame your passion for music and life continue. Oh, Tim, thanks very much. It's Lovely talk. The to life you. of the chat with you. Thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs>